Friends, the Lord be with you and also with you. Wherever you are on this white winter morning, whether you gather in front of a phone or a TV screen or a computer, I hope you know, I hope you can feel that the God of all things is with you, that his spirit is with you. As you enter worship this morning, wherever you are, God is with you, and he bids you to come, to offer your weariness and your shame and your joy and your sorrow. He bids us to come in all of those things. So let us enter into this time of worship, praising God for his generous love, asking him to reorient us toward him, to remind us that we are his and that he never lets us go. As we enter worship this morning, church, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ. 
the kingdom of God has come near, a kingdom of peace, justice, and righteousness. But the powers of the kingdom of darkness still beset us. Our days are marked by temptations. Those temptations turn too easily into sin. But Christ, who himself faced temptations, is yet our living hope, offering us forgiveness, inviting us into his freedom. So let us repent of our sins and turn toward the one who is our salvation. This morning, Amy will lead us in a prayer of confession. Sheltering God, you have called us to follow you into your love, your goodness, your freedom. We confess that so often we choose to follow the tempter instead. We listen to the lies that promise us whatever we want and we foolishly believe that what we want is better than what you provide. Forgive us for following the path of temptation and sin. Protect us when lies are loud. Lead us away from that path by your power, for on our own we can do nothing. Draw us in and shelter us. O oh God, we stand in need of you. Oh 
Friends, our God is a sheltering and ever-present God. So let us profess together the good news found in Psalm 121, answering the psalmist's question, where does our help come from? Would you say this with me? My My help help comes comes from from the Lord, Lord, the maker maker of heaven and and earth. earth. He He will will not let my foot slip. He who watches over me will not slumber. The The Lord watches over me. The Lord is my shade at my right hand. The The sun will not harm me by day, nor the moon by night. The The Lord will keep me from all harm. He will watch over my life. The Lord will watch over my coming and going, both now and forever. And that promise that God would be with us, that promise is sealed in Jesus' baptism. So let's now remember that as we listen to this water being poured. Amen and amen. This season of Epiphany, we're going through Mark 1 a little bit at a time, um, taking in the ways that Jesus began shining his Epiphany light into the Judean countryside. This is how God entered the world, and this is how the redemptive work of Jesus began. Our text this morning is short. It's verses 12 and 13 from Mark 1. They sound like this. After Jesus was baptized, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. 
He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Son of God went to the wilderness alone to meet the devil. He had only the clothes on his back. He brought no food, as the devil points out. And the devil, Mark calls him the adversary. Luke calls him the accuser. Brings all of the charm, the panache, the anger and wit he can muster to achieve his single goal to separate Jesus from the Father. Mark covers it quickly. Luke takes a little more time, so I want you to hear that too. Turn your Bibles to Luke 4 if you'd like. In the meantime, remember these words from Hebrews 4. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And these from Romans 20, Romans 8, 20. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. So listen to this from Luke 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was sent by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days. And when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give all of their glory and all of this authority, for it has been given to me, and I give it to whoever I choose. If you will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on top of the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, The Lord will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and with their hands they will bear you up, so you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not tempt the Lord your God. When the devil had finished these tests, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So like Peter says, the devil continues to prowl around like a lion looking for someone to devour. But he never found a more opportune time to get to Jesus. He could never triumph against Jesus directly, so he had to go around sowing his lies, encouraging unrest in the religious community, corrupting hearts, so that when it came time to choose who should live between Jesus and the revolutionary Barabbas, the crowd chose Barabbas. Lying and deceit and dividing and tearing down That is the extent of Satan's power, though not since the book of Job had we seen it so strongly sent against one individual. You remember Job, the perfect servant of God, blessed in every way, and yet always so obedient. Like a playground bully, the devil comes and wrecks everything around him, just trying to get him to curse God's name. 
The devil's goal in the desert with Jesus is the same as it was with Job, to divide God's servant from God because to ruin God would be a gain for the devil. They're directly opposed, Satan and Jesus, and foils for each other. All the light that Satan can absorb is reflected magnificently onto the Son of the Most High. Where Satan lies, Jesus tells the truth. Where Satan attacks, Jesus deflects. When Satan tries to manipulate, Jesus remains firmly planted in the truth. They're opposed, but they're not equals. Make no mistake, in these 40 days, the devil never stood a chance of achieving his goal. That Jesus was tempted shows us his humanity. That he endured his temptation without giving an inch shows us that he was also God, united to the Father by the Holy Spirit in every moment for all of time. For the devil to try to alter that was frankly a futile effort, the three persons of the Trinity being inseparable. Nonetheless, Jesus was tempted. And as many preachers before me have no doubt pointed out, there is just enough truth in the devil's claims to make them actually quite dangerous. The ideas he proposed were well within Jesus' ability. How many, how many loaves of bread would Jesus make over the course of his ministry? Jesus' mortal body did indeed defy gravity when he ascended to heaven with or without the help of angels. And that vision of all the nations bowing before Jesus Christ, saying something like, I don't know, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. That's from Revelation 7, a moment in Jesus' actual future, as prophesied by John. Satan knows just enough of what's in store for Jesus to twist it, to claim that he can make it happen sooner and easier, and ultimately to prey on the desire of the Son of God. So we know the play-by-play, -play, but I've still been wondering why Jesus had to endure the temptation. Doing it to showcase his own perfection is about equal to tossing himself off the pinnacle of the temple if you can, you should. No, I, since the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness, it was a matter of must, of distinct purpose according to the will of God the Father. And there are probably more reasons why than what I can see, but as I sought the wisdom of my elders this week, I found two good reasons for Jesus to have endured the temptation. The first comes from 4th century Christian Gregory of Nazianzus, who wrote, what he has not assumed, he has not healed. Speaking of Jesus, what he has not assumed, he has not healed. For Gregory, this spoke to the dual natures of Jesus Christ. He was both God and human, bringing all of God's divinity into the finite person of Jesus of Nazareth, who had a mind, body, personality, all unique, all his own. For Gregory, Jesus took on all of those things and redeemed them because whatever he has not assumed, he has not healed. Jesus took on a human body to heal the condition of all of our bodies. We who are made of dust, who have blemishes and sicknesses and stress responses, we've been offered healing because of the one who went ahead of us to the cross, because Jesus took on a body. And Jesus took on a human mind to heal the condition of all of our minds. We who use our minds for both good and evil, for things colossal and mundane, and for us who still desire what is not right, who are so close to ruin all the time, we have been offered a way to resist that evil in him whom the Father sent. And so Jesus assumed our temptation. He took it on in order to heal it. So that ambivalence we sometimes feel about our moral lives, 
doesn't matter if I do this, I guess, since nobody's looking. And the selfishness, yeah, I, I deserve that. And the hopelessness we feel when we wonder why Jesus hasn't come back yet and just fixed it all for us. All of those things that we experience in our own 40 days of the desert have been spoken for. Jesus carried them with him on his way to the cross and he picked them up here. For 40 days he endured temptation and solitude not merely as a symbol of participation in our lives, not merely so that he understands intellectually what it's like to be us, but as a claim, this too I will redeem. What he has not assumed, he has not healed. And in the desert, Jesus assumed all of it. So that's the first elder, Gregory of Nazianzus. The second is John Calvin. In his gospel commentary, he gives another reason behind Jesus' temptation. For him, those 40 days were a battle in which Jesus fought, quote, in single combat with the devil, that by his victory, he might obtain a triumph for us. By his victory, he might obtain a triumph for us. A flag on the battlefield. David felled Goliath, and now there's a signal out there that says advance out of hopelessness and out of misery. Calvin calls it a battle because that's what it always was for us. This hopeless uphill push against sin and death. We were losing. We had lost actually. Jesus is called the second Adam because he did what the first Adam could not. He showed us that when the Spirit of God is on our side, we can repel the devil's advances and there is nothing he can do to us. That victory leads us forward out of the desert into the new Eden. That is what has been won for us. So maybe we're still tempted and sure there's still sin in the world, but we now have what we need to withstand the devil's onslaught, namely the sure knowledge that Jesus is with us. The devil said it himself, actually. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, the Lord will command his angels concerning you to protect you so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. That's Psalm 91. The twist he put on it runs something like, do whatever you want and God will catch you. The way we should read it, what it actually says is choose to surrender your life to the Most High, and He will protect you. Two observations here. One, notice how much of the devil's strategy relies on manipulation. Did you feel something like that? Jesus is hungry in the desert. His body is crying out for food. As the perfect Son of God, he is listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit who tells him it's not time to eat yet. Then the accuser shows up and tries to create a new reality for Jesus. You know, actually, if you were the Son of God, you'd be eating right now. Don't let the accuser feed you his lies. If you feel trapped in sin, ask for help. If you're battling an addiction, seek accountability, seek connection. There is no snare that Jesus can't fetch you out of. So to all this, St. Augustine adds, do you think only of Christ's temptations and fail to think of his victory? See yourself as tempted in him and see yourself as victorious in him. He could have kept the devil from himself, but if he were not tempted, he could not teach you how to triumph over temptation. Second, Jesus fought with no weapon. And that should matter to us. I don't know about you, but I've seen enough guns being brandished lately. Haven't you feared enough for your lives or the lives of your daughters and sons or friends, relatives. A close friend of mine was three blocks away when the riots happened in the Capitol on the 6th. And as we speak, 
The capital is filling up with thousands of extra troops in case what's being threatened is actually followed through. And the kingdom of God promised to be this place of peace and righteousness seems so far off. Those of us who have given our lives to Jesus would do well to remember that when he approached the evil one, he brought no weapon. He had the presence of the Holy Spirit with him. He had a ready command of scripture and a commitment to prayer. His hands were empty. His hands were always empty. And from his victory, we can learn that our hands can remain empty too. Because we are not alone and we never have been. And the devil is wrong and he always will be. And the only real power the devil has over our lives is the power we let in to influence us. Because there is one healing and one victory and they come from Jesus Christ. So I'll leave you with these words from 1 Peter 5. He says to the church, discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, it's in your name that we pray as sinners who have been made clean by your sacrifice. In your great love, you fought for us and you chose to endure a life of trial and human difficulty in order to bring us healing and the promise of brighter days ahead. Unto you, O oh, blessed Son, is all power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing like the nations sing to you. You are our fortress and our rock, and whoever is in you is saved. So we know that though the devil comes to steal and kill and destroy, your very life guarantees that we may have life and live to its fullest. We praise you, our deliverer. At the same time, Jesus, we confess that when we feel the grip of fear upon us, or feel the pull of sinful temptation, we do sometimes doubt your power and your presence and your delivering hand. And we have at times given over to that fear, given ourselves over to that fear or temptation instead of enduring it with your Spirit's help. Forgive us, O oh God, for ignoring your presence in times of trial. And God, we admit to you that our lives are so fragile. Every day we hear more of more lives being cut short because of human sin or the ravages of a broken world. As a coronavirus death toll soars around the world, we pray for healing and deliverance and for the rest of the sick, including especially today Lydia Kemperman, who experienced multiple seizures yesterday. God deliver her and make her whole again. as our nation holds its breath going into this week, God, I pray for a relief from violence, that those who would mean harm would stay at home. But more than that, I pray for healing into our fractured society, that anger would be replaced by compassion and disagreement with understanding. The problems of our day seem too large to manage, much less to pray for it, but God, nothing is too big for you. And as we pray for change, for the better, for healing, 
and the coming of your kingdom. As we pray for those things, we offer ourselves ready to be your agents. Help us to carry your grace into places of disagreement. Make us ready to forgive when we have been wronged. Help us to remain strong in you when we are tempted. Teach us your way of peace. Above all, O oh God, you are our hope and our shield. Thank you for sustaining us and for keeping us safe. As we go today, we pray that you would send us forth stronger in faith than we came and more eager yet to testify to your light. In your holy name we pray, amen. Next, I invite you to sing with me this song, You Are With Me, written out of Psalm 121, some bits of Ezekiel, and that refrain, I know you're with me, you are for me, you've been behind me, you go before, it comes out of the firm assurance that God is with us and for us. He's not going anywhere. as you go out into the world today, may the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, restore, support, strengthen, 
and establish you. In his name, amen.